Hi, I'm Zach with Josh's Frogs, and I'm here with Mark Mandika from the Amphibian Foundation with some exciting news for y'all that we wanted to share. So let's start this off, Mark. Why don't you introduce yourself and talk about what the Amphibian Health Foundation is and what it's about? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I am Mark Mandika. I am a co-founder and also the executive director of the Amphibian Foundation. We're located in Atlanta, Georgia. And we started primarily to conserve the frosted flatwood salamander. Uh, this was almost six years ago now. And since then, we've added some other amphibian conservation projects like gopher frogs, striped newts, and pigeon mountain salamanders. And we do a lot of educational programs as well, uh, just trying to get people pumped about amphibians and amphibian conservation because they, as, as I'm sure your viewers know, are in a uh, catastrophic decline and you know, most people still don't even know about it. Yeah, that is very, very, very cool. Um, you know, well, I know a lot of our, our viewers right now could definitely relate to, you know, keeping amphibians, um, you know, working with them and just the need for conservation out there. Um, it seems the more we, um, the more the, you know, humanity grows and stuff, the more of these types of things run into and the more just it's importance with what y'all are doing. Um, cool. Um, I know when you reached out, you were excited because you had some really awesome success with these flatwood salamanders. And yeah, yes. I, I think I, I um, opened up that email on my cell phone. I think while I was in bed, getting ready to go to bed one night, my wife was like, what on earth did you just yell about? And I'm like, this is really cool. We might have to talk to this guy. Um, oh, yeah. thanks. Yeah. So, yeah. So she doesn't appreciate, I do though. Yeah. She appreciates your sleep. She appreciates the gummy lizards too. Don't get her wrong. But cool. Okay. Uh, feel free to yeah, share some pictures and tell us, tell us what this big success okay. was. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll give a little bit of the backstory, but just to say, you know, we uh, just successfully bred the flatwood, frosted flatwood salamander. Uh, this was our ultimate goal, and it's the first time that that, is, that has ever happened. So we're extremely excited about that. You know, this is a project we've been working on for ten years. You know, and so with various limitations, it's been extremely difficult to breed this species. Uh, most people, even amphibian enthusiasts, don't know what a frosted flatwood salamander is. Uh, if they know what it is, it's extremely likely they've never seen one. And so that's been one of the challenges too, is to get people excited about uh, conserving a, a salamander they've never heard of or will most likely never see. Um, but they used to be quite common here in the Southeast. Um, they were listed uh, under the Endangered Species Act as threatened in 1999, and since then have declined by 90%. So that's not even that long ago. But um, I'll, you know, I'll show you, give you a little bit of the backstory and uh, show some of the uh, current range maps and where we're, we're still out looking for these things. Um, if, if that works for you, I'll go Absolutely. Ahead and share what do you okay. say, viewers? You don't have a choice because this is just a two-way conversation. You're seeing a recording, but we're going to go for it. It's pretty cool information. Okay, good. Well, it would be my pleasure to share this with you. Um, so I'm going to share the screen. And this charming salamander is a frosted flatwood salamander. Uh, can you see that okay, Zach? I, I see a very, very happy cod out staring They just have that smile that I love. <laughs> um, and so, you know, this, this is one, one important slide here. It doesn't look like much, but what you're seeing here is August 9th, 2016. Uh, this is the day that we, my wife and I founded the Amphibian Foundation, and we started with uh, 18 frosted flatwood salamanders, uh, and this, what you're looking at in this modest rack of, of tanks is the world's only captive colony, okay? So there's, crazy. we had the world's only captive colony in our basement, and it was uh, very <laughs> stressful, uh, and we had these two and a half gallon tanks and this sphagnum from Josh's frogs that y'all have been providing <laughs> for us for this project from the beginning. So, you know, it's, re it's really helpful and supportive. And, you know, you know, it's just, this has been a, a lot of uh, partners who want to see these salamanders do well. Um, and so, 
you know, I should also point out that this salamander here in this picture I drew, uh, I just love <laughs> that species. And so it took me three days to draw just the white dots of the reticulation pattern. But I'll anyway, honest, so until you said that, I assumed it was a photo. So good job. Oh, hey, thank <laughs> you. Awesome. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, okay. So that that's um that is August 9th, 2016. So by October. October, we had moved into our current facility, which is a nature preserve in Atlanta. We share the building with uh, Georgia Audubon. Um, and so it's, it's a, got a really nice vibe in there. And then so we so this was our this is our current salamander lab um, where we have our flatwoods and you see even more moss. See, Zach, that's how we wet the moss there in that big yeah. trash can. Oh, yeah. And that's why I ask you for so much at a time, because these guys are all on sphagnum. This we've tried a variety of different strategies to keep these things alive, and this is what work has worked for us. We are the fourth institution to try a program for these, and the first three had did not do well. And so, you know, it's it's pretty interesting. Um, we have gotten really good at keeping these uh, salamanders alive. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why I don't want to toot my own horn too much, but why it's so impressive uh, as, as I tell you where we're getting these animals from. Uh, oh, oh, I skipped a good one. So let me go back. Um, I skipped a good one. So this is the other view of the Flatwood Salamander Lab. And so here are our breeding setups. And so you see on the left here, is a 180 gallon kind of an indoor mesocosm, a miniature ecosystem of the longleaf pine habitat minus the trees. Of course, we don't have any, any longleaf pine trees in there. And then on the right, you'll see uh, what I call ecotonal rain chambers. If you're, if you're unfamiliar with the ecotone, that is the graduation between the upland and the wetland. Uh, and it's vital habitat for flatwood salamanders because that's where they nest. Flatwood salamanders breed in dry ponds. If there's water in the ponds, they won't breed in them. And they lay them at the edges in the upper edges in the ecotone. So we just tried to create just the ecotone for these salamanders to want to nest in. Hopefully that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. That looks really awesome. Thank you. Uh, it's yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, lots of plant collections from down in their breeding habitat. Uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife, Georgia DNR have all helped us collect these plants as well. And so it's been uh, a lot of a lot many hands uh, contributing to this. And this is a pretty thank you. It's a pretty small room too. It's like twelve by twelve. So there's a lot of. Lot, every space is used. I'll, let's just put it that way. Here is a flatwood salamander, uh, another one. This is a different view, but I, you know, I just like to show them off because they're really beautiful salamanders. Here's a couple more. <laughs> and then I should mention, you know, just in case there are two flatwood salamanders. Um, they're very difficult to tell apart, if not impossible, except for genetically. On the left is the reticulated flatwood salamander, Ambistoma bishopi. Now the San Antonio Zoo is heading a project uh, to conserve bishopi. And then we focus on the frosted flatwood salamander on the right, Ambistoma cingulatum. Here are some more of our partners on this project. And then as I already mentioned, uh, flat, flatwood salamanders have declined by 90% since 1999, and that is precipitous. They are at imminent risk of extinction. Uh, without uh, dramatic conservation efforts, this species could be extinct in 10, 10 years easy. Um, and here's just a little indication here is the historic range of flatwood salamanders. And you see if I had posted also a map of the longleaf pine ecosystem, you would see that these two ranges line up pretty perfectly. Uh, so here's the historic range. Here's the current range of the flatwood salamander. Let me just show you that again. The historic range, current range. And then I'll zoom in here. And you can see um, we're looking at the orange dots. The blue dots are bishopi. The orange dots are cingulatum. The one 
connecting dot in South Carolina is uh, Francis Marion National Forest, where they haven't been found in 13 years. Uh, the one dot in Georgia is the last, there's one wetland left in the entire state that has flatwood salamanders, one. Um, and it's, it's, they're declining even there. Um, we've been surveying that wetland since 2012. We haven't seen them in the last two years. So it's, it's pretty frightening. Um, the last two clusters in Florida are St. Mark's and Apalachicola National Forest. So, um, and they're not doing well there either. It's just that there are multiple wetlands there. Although St. Mark's was hit directly by Hurricane Michael in 2018 and their breeding ponds were underneath the ocean for six days. So that you can see this is a sensitive species to, to put it mildly. Yeah, that is, that is wild. I think a lot of times when you think of a, an endangered animal or whatnot, you think of something that lives in a remote tropics or something like this. And this is a salamander that's literally disappearing out of people's backyards here in the US. Yeah. Um, what's the primary true. cause of uh, uh, population decreasing? Uh, well, that is that is complicated. Uh, primarily, it's the loss of the longleaf pine habitat. So, you know, only 3% three, 3 of that habitat remains. Wow. Um, and so that's pretty, pretty bad. You know, lots of, lots of animals rely on that habitat. Besides the salamander, we have gopher frogs, striped newts, gopher tortoise, indigo snake. Um, and so that's, that's the primary reason. But, you know, the, also the flatwood salamander is dependent on fire, like utterly dependent. If fire, wildfires are suppressed, then flatwood salamanders will blink out. So that's a problem for the salamander, even in protected areas like the wildlife refuge or a national forest. You know, if they aren't, if wildfires aren't allowed to burn through there, then the salamanders are not gonna continue to persist. So that's another big challenge. Um, and then, you know, the other thing, like there's three major things. The third major thing is I already described that the species breeds in dry ponds. Their eggs like literally wait in these dry pond basins for seasonal rains to fill their ponds. And, you know, more and more the weather is becoming increasingly unpredictable. And these eggs are drying out in the field and dying. You know, so they're getting really hit by all three of these climate, um, the fire suppression and habitat loss are super significant factors for flatwood salamanders, which is why they're just declining so rapidly. Yeah, that is, that is wild. That's, yeah. At least we've, at least you've got them breeding in captivity now. So there can be some, some hope <laughs> yeah. that way because man, that map does yeah. not look reassuring. No, it doesn't. But you know, we we do have partners which are restoring habitat. We have partners who are paying more attention to natural burn cycles. You know, so you know, we we have a small group of animals that we bred this year, and so we have a few more years to figure out how to bump up the production numbers, and so that hopefully, when the time comes, we'll have some really nice restored habitat to release them into. Yeah, awesome. that's the goal. That's really cool. Yeah, so here's some of our uh, sampling team. This is out at that one site that remains in Georgia. Um, it's on an, the Fort Stewart Army base. So here's some Army biologists here too. Uh, I'm showing, highlighting this endangered species site sign because on, far, on Fort Stewart, there are 24 ponds with signs like this. And they can't even engage in military activities in those sites because of the salamanders. So I just think that's really neat, that um, cool. right? The salamanders have precedence over a little piece of this army base. Yeah. Heck of an armed defense too, I'd imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No one's going to mess with them. Yeah. Um, and so when we when we're surveying for these, this is what we're looking for: the larvae. The, the salamanders themselves are underground 50 weeks of the year. So you don't, you don't really spend time looking for the adults unless you have uh, fen fences and traps set up to intercept them. Uh, so we go after the larvae and this is what they look like. They have these really bold stripes. 
Um, they're meant to blend into flooded grasslands and they really do like these things are invisible. You have to get in there with dip nets and really get, get at them to find them. Um, and so, you know, it's not easy to find these things. And when we go out looking for them, um, you know, we, we're just trying to verify that they're there. If they're there, then, you know, we don't take them back to captivity unless we find a significant, number. The only time we'll take larvae out of the wild is if their pond is drying too fast and they're just going to die. If that's the case, then that changes into a rescue mission and then we can take some into our captive program. Uh, sometimes we find them. Here's a really awesome picture. Like they're top predators. Once they get to a certain size, they're the top predators in these little wetlands. So that's also pretty cool. Like they're uh, very aggressive when they get large, like a, a tiger salamander larvae. That's awesome. Yeah. And so here, here's what I was, another, another way we get animals is through salvaging these eggs that are drying out in the field. So they, they lay their eggs, and if the rains don't come, the eggs just wither and die. So for the last few years, Florida Fish and Wildlife has been salvaging these eggs. And I have to emphasize they are literally climb, crawling around on their hands and knees looking for eggs. And when they find them, they put a flag there so they can keep an eye on them. And then if they're gonna die, then they're collected. And so a portion of these collected eggs are brought back to the amphibian foundation where we hatch them and grow them up into adults. So here's us hatching them. We scoop them out one at a time in these spoons. Um, here, the one drop of water is all it takes to hatch these things because they're so far past the time where they would have hatched naturally. So that's a flatwood salamander in a drop of water on a teaspoon. That's what we're seeing right there. <laughs> that's wild. Um, yeah. And so they're tiny, you know, from a husbandry standpoint, that is a tiny predator right there. And so the challenge is to find little wiggling prey items that they're going to want to eat. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's the stage where it can be challenging because once they get a little bit of the size on them, they're less particular about what they'll eat. <laughs> so here's a lab reared larvae. And then here's one right at metamorphosis. So you can see the larval striping, but you can also see the adult patterning starting to come in. And it's just kind of, uh, it's in that awkward stage. <laughs> Here's one that's taking its very first steps. It just metamorphosed and it's kind of learning how to walk, but it's just so cute and clumsy. And here's one of our big beefy adult salamanders that we raised from, uh, you know, these eggs that we saved from the wild. So, you know, we've, we have really gotten good at, at raising these salamanders up from eggs into uh, reproductive adults but we had not been able to breed them until this year. So that's super exciting too. Here's some more of our lab reared animals. Oh, here's a little video. Look at the one in the middle. He's about to start. Yeah, there he goes. <laughs> and uh, so this is an exciting time for us bringing our lab reared animals out into our outdoor mesocosms where, where most of our animals are in outdoor artificial wetlands. But here's the, you know, the reason why you and I first connected for this time was that we bred these things. So right before Christmas, I was in there really early. The lights hadn't come on yet. I had my son with me and he had a, I had a headlamp on him and he's like, uh, dad, I think there's eggs in here. And I was like, yeah, whatever. I didn't, I didn't believe him at first. Uh, cause you know, we, we've been trying to do this for years and we hadn't had any success. And then he's like, Oh no, dad, we got some eggs in here. And sure enough, these are the first eggs we had found. Uh, um, we had gotten many more eggs since these, but these were the first ones. It was very exciting. Uh, this was our first group they've bred uh, or they've laid eggs about six times since this, this time, then a second group bred, um, which is, uh, very exciting because it was from that one Georgia wetland, the animals from their bread. And then just yesterday, we had our first eggs laid in that big 
uh, 180-gallon indoor mesocosm. So that was very cool. exciting as well. Um, here's some you're more. Not just having like one success, you're having a lot of success all at once. That's that's really cool. Yes, that yeah, it's, is, not, it's, it's not a fluke. You've got it. You're figuring it out. Yeah, that's awesome. It seems like we have, and the fact that two of our three breeding strategies have worked. Uh, and incidentally, the one that I really thought was going to work has not worked yet. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of that, too. But also, you know, we were in Newsweek last week. So that was super exciting and on NPR. So, like, there's lots of, of excitement about this. And I'm very excited. And then, you know, just highlighting here, where will our babies go? You know, obviously, I'm going to be very particular about what happens with our with our F1s. Um, what what it seems like we're going to do with these babies is start to find uh, institutions that want to form redundant colonies so we can really ramp up our production numbers over the next few years. Um, we want to be able to release thousands of flatwood salamanders a year. And so that's going to be uh, an important next step. But it's really exciting to think about these next steps <laughs> because bre breeding these has been the focus for for so long. Yeah, that is that is really really cool. Um, for those people watching that want to um, find out more or help out the flatwood salamanders and stuff, like where would they where would they go? What would they do? You can go right to our website. Um, you can donate specifically to the Flatwood Salamander Project. Um, you can become a member of our on our Patreon, which you can also see right from our uh the main website which is amphibianfoundation.org um and there's other ways if, if you want to help but you don't have uh aren't able to help financially there's we have a, a bunch of ways that you can help the salamanders and other amphibians um on our website as well um i wanted to highlight these mesocosms too just because like this is a super nerdy thing that i'm psyched about that i think you, uh, Zach, and, and other uh, amphibian enthusiasts will get a <laughs> kick out of at least. And that's these little artificial wetlands that we have built, these mesocosms. You can see the wetland, the upland, and the ecotone here that we've set up. And we have uh, 33 of these. Um, most, most of them have flatwood salamanders, but some of them have gopher frogs. We have ring salamanders, tiger salamanders, marbled spotted um, moles so it's just a it's kind of an ambistum of frenzy over here plus <laughs> gopher frogs uh, but it's really great and it's right on the trail because uh the preserve that we're on is an as a city park so you know we have signage there explaining what's going on in these things you know as a way to inform the public but also try to encourage people not to mess with with the mesocosms <laughs> But yeah, so that's pretty cool too. Um, and so, you know, this is where I thought our flatwoods would breed first, but they haven't bred out here yet. Breeding season's not over, but soon. We have had marbled salamanders breed uh, in October. So that was exciting. That's really cool too. Thank you. That uh, really you know, I know marbled like supposedly used to exist in extreme Southern Michigan where I'm at, but they haven't been seen in might have been even since like the 60s or something crazy like that oh wow yeah, yeah. that's quite a while and it's it's kind of debatable if they did exist in michigan or not at least that's what my um, herpetology professor at msu would always say so that's well that is really really cool stuff um i was really shocked to see also that like they bred like in the room like in those artificial like i would have been the same boat yeah. as you like outdoors with the same weather patterns with uh yeah, yeah. That's, that's just wild that's yeah cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. Hopefully they'll breed in the outdoor music cosms because we've just invested so much time and effort and there's there's hundreds of flatwood salamanders in those music cosms. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> we, but not this year, it looks like, but maybe next. That's really, really awesome. Uh, well, Mark, I really appreciate you. you taking the time to just inform us of the goings on. And I look forward to, you know, touching base with you in the future. Um, just about, you know, that no accomplishment or cool thing to do um hopefully we're sounds like we're coming out of covid so hopefully maybe we'll be able to actually 
meet in person and uh, <laughs> maybe maybe that, 2022 is the year you know <laughs> uh, that'd be fantastic i'd love it and uh, yeah. you know I'm, I'm really happy to connect with you here and really grateful for all the support that you've given uh, amphibian well, foundation so thank you ab absolutely absolutely i was i was happy that you allowed us to play a small role in um uh, a success and stuff like that you know with i think the state of the world and the things like wins like that can just be be pretty huge that's a that's a huge win for a for a small salamander so <laughs> that, is, that is really awesome cool uh, um, yeah thanks for spending time with us today um, sure I'll make thank sure, you uh, this will when we publish this on marketing i'll um make sure to link to the amphibian the foundation and stuff so our customers and audience can can check it out and maybe participate in their own way so awesome thanks a lot Mark. Yeah.